Oh, welcome back. When I had left you off, I had introduced that place beyond, where all things can be found, can be learned, can be seen. Today, let's continue our journey and get to see the Mansus. As previously mentioned, the Mansus is that place beyond the waking world, accessible only through dreams and occult practices. The powers that move within it are many and dangerous, and so it is of the utmost importance that those who find themselves here proceed with caution, and only when they are confident they are ready. For in this place, all progress comes with a cost. Throughout the House of the Sun, there are many places we might go. Each one offers different opportunities to the adventuring mortal, but also different risks. These regions of the Mansus are each blocked by a series of barriers, each demanding something of those who seek to pass. There are many ways into the Mansus, and today, we shall start our journey with the place most new in the House of the Sun find themselves upon their first accidental arrival. The Wood. The Wood is so often the first place newcomers to the Mansus find themselves, and that's not an accident. Entry to this place costs little to those who wish to pass, but be warned, even though it's far from the light of the glory, the wood is still home to many places and powers. Even some of the hours are known to move in this place, so be careful. Today, I will show you two special places here in the wood, the Temple of the Wheel, and the first of our destinations, the Well. The Well is never dry, though it is also never clear. On occasion, it is packed with crawling roots. At other times, when the moon is full and bright, its surface is packed with the dead remains of moths. This place is sacred to the hours Velvet and Grail. And, on occasion, when their power is present, it may be found overgrown with moss, or perhaps clogged with viscous blood and gelatinous grail matter. So many things will rise from the well. Beyond the well is the Temple of the Wheel. Though the hour called Wheel is long gone, a monument to it and its kin still exists. In the wood, there is a spire of high, jagged rock, covered in black lichen, eye signs, and graffiti left by lesser powers, which, in spite of the time since the end of its namesake, is still called the Temple of the Wheel. It is said that suicides will sometimes jump from the temple in their dreams before they do in the waking world. Beyond the darkness of the wood, we find ourselves at the first of the gates which we must pass within the Mansus itself, the White Door. To get here is not easy, but the aspects of light, death, and openings shall surely lead us here safe. Upon arrival, passage through this gate is an exhausting process and it has been known to take its toll in the physical world beyond. But be warned, for that is not the only tax this place demands of those who pass. With death comes silence, but even still a greater silence overcomes those who pass the white door, beyond which none may speak. In that place beyond, the dead are silent, they wander losing themselves in the labyrinth of the bounds. Some scratch their stories into the softer stones. Others venture higher. Some find places they might choose to rest, 
for in this place there are comforts and accommodations. At the edge of the mansus, beyond the white door, is a pavilion of blue silk. It sits overlooking the bounds. In it, the dead fight with swords. Their blades are water, their attacks are ballet. Those who come here are welcomed guests of the short-haired hostess whose eyes remain behind dark glasses. There they sit on velvet cushions, drink dream wine, and hear her stories. For even in this place, she knows how to speak. As we pass further on and leave the Lodge of the Sage Knight, we shall come across the Orchard of Lights. The orchard was once a place that the hour who ruled the Mansus was known to visit. Even after his division, some of his remnants still do. The fruit here is luminous, it tastes of spring turning to summer, and it is always ripe. The roots of the trees are shaped perfectly for rest, and the mists soothe the heart. As the occultist Christopher Illopoli once said, the invisible arts are as profitable as macrame, as ethical as tobacco smuggling, and in general as beneficial as roulette. Still, there is always the Orchard of Lights. Should we muster the will and choose to leave the comforts of the white door behind, we shall find ourselves at the stag door. The stag door was once the boundary beyond which no mortal could pass. This has not been the case for a long time, and the door bears the scars to show it. Entry, however, is not free. To pass the door, one must answer the riddles of Gyrbi, he who first broke the doors open and allowed those hours from flesh to ascend, as the punishment for his crimes. He now waits guard, never to pass. As we pass this door, the tax is not on the body, but the mind. Never mind it, though. If we are safe, we will recover. And if we are not, well, let's not dwell on such things. Soon after entry, we shall see the Painted River. High above the Orchard of Lights and near the White Door is a mural said to have been painted by the Vagabond herself, depicting a river. Ships and water and people in vibrant colors, green and gold, blue and red. Before the eyes, the ships move up and down. This is no mundane mural. This is something more. Should we venture further, we shall find ourselves at the Ascent of Knives. This place has been sacred to the sun in rags and the meniscate since the intercalate. It has been said, the ascent is glass, the walls are knives, each step is blood. The ascent of knives is a place of pain and cold, but also of hunger. Beneath the steps are those creatures of the mansus who would feast on the drops of blood which fall from those who travel this road. The sharp stair takes one higher into the mansus and those deceased mortals who manage to ascend beyond the pain are transformed into maids in the mirror. As we ascend beyond the stag door, driven and guided by the powers of thirst and sight and passage, we shall find ourselves at the spider door. Of poisons, it can be said that you should not give them to anyone you wish to keep. Of the spider door, it can be said that you should take to it none you wish to keep. For this place knows thirst beyond any you have ever known. It might even be said that the door is second only to the grail in thirst. Either way, with this place, fewer leave than enter. Beyond the spider door is the Maliary, where change incarnate dwells. And while none who enter the Mansus ever truly leave unchanged, 
There is one place where that is truer than anywhere else. In the Maliari, the Forge of Days rules, that hour of change and creation, and, for this reason, there is one place in the Mansis which will change you, maybe more so than any other. Our next stop in this Ever Ascension is sometimes called the Concorsum, sometimes the Chamber of Mirrors, sometimes it is the Chamber of Revelations, Sometimes it is something else, is something else, is something else. The chamber could be said to be the center of everything. It is said that from here, bathed in its cobalt light, those gods we call the Hours can see everything. In some histories, it has been said that all roads lead to Rome. But here, in the Mansus, all roads lead to the chamber. Should we pick the right road from the chamber, one we select through our intellect, cunning, or knowledge of locks and keys, we might find ourselves lucky and stand before the peacock's door. Some doors open. This one does not. The peacock's door is perfect, and cracks do not mar its surface. It is the highest point which mortals may reach, and beyond its amethyst surface there is only the tricuspid gate and the glory which mortals may not pass. If one listens to this door, which predates humanity and will survive us too, it may speak to you. It may even teach you to understand it as well. Passage through this door requires no tax on the body or mind. Rather, like its predecessor, it demands a tax external to those who wish to pass. In a way, it demands your soul, or at least the vessel that holds a fragment of it. Though, should we be unable to enter this place with that, there exists a key that will open even this door. Our first stop here is the Red Church. Here, red light rains down on carnal pleasures through glass stained in the myriad appetites of the human body. Here, that hour known as Grail feasts, while those who serve it labor to construct novel desires. They gossip and spread rumors of pleasure and thirst. In the stained glass of the windows, scenes, each from reality, depict the satiation of all sorts of distinct appetites. When we have left the place where all pleasures can be found, we will find ourselves at perhaps the most contrasting development yet, a museum. But do not allow yourselves to feel that this place is uninteresting or unimportant. For there are things which, if they had their way, would bury the Mansus in the nowhere. Those things which bred in the corpse of the sun, and in which the living hours seek to inspire revulsion. This place is a testament to that. The Worm Museum is not intended for easy visitation, warded against intruders as it is. Situated both within the Mansus, for security, and without the Mansus, for safety. But in spite of the difficulties, some may still visit if they know the way in. And perhaps that is the point. Imprisoned within these walls are captive worms. Their bodies are smooth and dark and always dying, but never dead. As well as declarations of their crimes, stories from the first two worm wars are on full display though the third is still too recent to have passed into the histories. Here, the aspect of winter is strong, and its guardian, the hour, the colonel, wields that coldness as a defense against those who would pose a threat. Even the other hours dare not challenge him here.
The last of our visitations is a place beyond which I will not take you, but about which I will tell you. Here we stand at the tricuspid gate. Beyond it, there is only the summit of the Mansus. There, the hours parlay and the world's secrets are curated. It is in that place where the light of the Mansus is the strongest that one might achieve enlightenment and immortality. The glory which defines the Mansus is pure light. It is the origin of the gods from light, and it is the inverse of the nowhere. Unfortunately, however, I am unable to take you there. Should you wish to see it, you must find a way in for yourself. I end this journey not in light, but in dark. If it is always possible to be deader, the nowhere is where that possibility is true. Home to those hours, the gods from nowhere, as well as to the enemies of the Mansus, the worms. The nowhere is not an endless void, but rather the inversion of the glory. It is where the dead reside, both dead mortals and dead hours, and where they forever descend deeper. Though, should you someday find yourself here, do not worry, for there is one who might remember you, and, if you're lucky, he might call you back again. Thank you.